All right, uh, I'm going to talk about growing and shrinking, right? Because whatever you're doing for God, like your church or whatever particular ministry you're doing over time, you're going to see it grow and you're going to see it shrink, right? Just, just see it, show a hands and air. Anyone who's been seeing their ministry shrink lately? Okay, I, I see those hands. Anyone been seeing their ministry grow lately? Okay, so we've got a kind of sort of like 50-50 thing going on and some people are just like, total level like um and so here's the here's the thing right uh when you grow that's a good thing right we we want to grow but the funny thing about when you grow is that you also tend to become proud and arrogant when when you grow it's just a common common thing that affects all of us because we all got indwelling sin in us right that we're growing and we're thinking yeah that's what we're supposed to be doing right we're growing but then we end up battling pride Okay, so that's a problem. But then when we shrink, when we see people leave our church, when we see people turn away from Jesus, uh, when the funding dries up and all kinds of stuff, then when it dry, dries up and all that kind of stuff, then you can get really discouraged, right? And then, and then you're really discouraged. And that's, that's not a good thing as well. So whether you're growing or shrinking, you've got a problem, Okay. And so that's what, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to look at here. So first, I just want to show you something in Exodus, right? Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, it says this, it said, when Pharaoh let the people go, and remember, this is when he's, he's freed the people from slavery in Egypt, right? He lets the people go and it says, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that way was shorter. So there was a way to go that would have made a lot of sense. God didn't lead them on that way. Why? It says, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So check it out. God's looking at the Israelites and he's like, they're not going to hack it going this certain path. So I'm going to lead them another way and make it easier for them where they don't face battle with the Philistines because they might, they might just turn away. The reason why I'm sharing this to you is because when you're growing, when all the ministry you're doing seems to work, you can get really tempted to think it's because you're doing all the right things. You can think it's because you're hardcore. You could do it because you think you're really staunch, because you think you're really faithful. But sometimes it's because you're not hardcore, you're not staunch, you're not really faithful. God's made stuff happen the easy way because you wouldn't be able to hack it the hard way. Okay, so for anyone who's been growing lately, right, hopefully that will help pride, yeah? Because it's like maybe we're just growing because I can't hack it and God's actually let us skip various battles with the Philistines and whatnot just to help us out. So, so if we're growing we want to avoid being proud. We want to be, avoid being arrogant. We want to be careful about saying, this is what I've done. You lot need to do the same thing. Listen, you just do this, 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 boom, then you're sorted. We want to be really careful about doing that. It's really, I, I know for, for you older heads, you get this, but I just speak to the, to the younger people in the room because I've been there. Like, be careful about writing them blog posts and stuff about or preaching at places about all the wonderful techniques that you have used. Because it might be that God grew your ministry in spite of all those <laughs> techniques that you used. Having said that, I'm not against using techniques. God is a God of means. And in the Bible, we see all kinds of means that he uses and we wanna, we wanna emulate those. But let's be careful about pride when we're growing Hopefully, those of you who were at the last Reach in the Unreached conference are thinking about growth in a different way anyway. Who was at the last Reach in the Unreached conference? Oh, that's, that's wonderful. So there we were talking about this first, right? Genesis 1, 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, blah, blah, blah. So we looked at how God made us in his image so that we could rule for him. He made us in his image so that we could spread his loving rule everywhere. And we looked at some of the things that are part of being made in the image of God. And this might be tough. Can anyone remember what any of them things are? Like just shout them out. Voice, excellent. Yeah, voice. 
Authority, yeah, how you respond to authority and use your authority, excellent. Protection. Protection, yeah, using your power to serve and protect. What else was there? Someone in our group was actually sharing about this in the workshop just now, about relationships. Being made in God's image means you have relationships, and so using our relationships to spread God's loving rule. Anyone remember anything else? Yes, making judgments, making assessments. So as human beings, we have the ability to make assessments. The better we do that, the better we reflect God in that, the, 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 the better we will spread his loving rule. Um, there's also enjoyment about how we enjoy stuff. So if you're wondering about that, just you can find that talk on YouTube, uh, you know. Um, but the point is, we don't want to assess growth by numbers. Numbers is something that is worth considering because in the Bible there's times when numbers are mentioned, right? So we don't want to be all super spiritual, like, like oh, we don't do numbers here, you know? But, but having said that, in terms of growth, we want to be thinking about, are we becoming more like God? How are we doing as image bearers? How is our church doing collectively as image bearers? How are we reflecting God? And think about growth in those terms. Also want to think about this. Does anyone remember shrinkies or shrinkadinks? I mean, it's still, it's still a thing, but when I was a kid, it was a Weetabix thing, right? So check it out. When I was a kid, in the Weetabix box, there was a Weetabix character called Dunk, okay? And I loved that because, I, you know, I didn't like my name, but then there was suddenly this, I was like, well, I'm called Duncan. And suddenly there's a Weetabix character called Dunk. And I, and I loved it. Notice it's spelled with a K as well. That's the proper way of spelling it. Um, this whole reason why I had this conference to make that clear, please. <laughs> Dunk is with a K, okay? Um, right, so, but you've got this flimsy but large card and it had a picture of Dunk, the Weetabix character, and you colour it in, because it's just black and white, you colour it in how you want it coloured in and then you cut a hole in it in the corner and then you put it in the oven and you bake it in the oven. Kids, don't do this at home without your parents' supervision. You bake it in the oven and then in the oven, what happens to it? It shrinks. It shrinks, but it also becomes hardened and it becomes shiny. And when you take it out of the oven and let it cool down, you then have a key ring. You have a cool, shiny dunk key ring. Amazing, wonderful thing. But part of the process was for it to shrink. And sometimes in our ministries, for God to form Christ in us, to make us more like Christ, to represent him better to the world, he shrinks us. There's bits that he wants to change and part of the process of that is shrinking us. We see that with Gideon's army, right? You know, it, it, God had to shrink down Gideon's army so that the way it did battle glorified God. You might be discouraged today being like, boy, we just keep shrinking. Like, and the thing is, how do you know that that isn't part of God's work in your life? A part of Jesus building his church, where Jesus is saying, I want it to be harder. I want it to be shinier. I want it to be used for things that it isn't being used at the moment. And the way to do that is to apply some heat and shrink things down. Because if we really believe Jesus has promised that he's building his church, then even when we see ourselves shrink, we have to trust that Jesus is doing his thing. But when people leave your church and the church shrinks, it's painful, right? It is painful and we want to acknowledge that. So it says in Romans 12, 15, it says, mourn with those who what? Mourn. Okay, so, so what that means is that it's okay to count the losses. It's actually healthy to count the losses. People leave your church, like, I would just say it's very unhealthy. If someone says to you, oh, I heard so-and-so left, you must be gutted. It's unhealthy to be like, no, I don't care about that. Like, God's building his church. That's, that is unhealthy. You should talk to someone about that, okay? Because there's a time to mourn. And, and God actually wants you to have people in your life who can mourn with you and count the losses. So find someone who can mourn with you. Now, Diane Langberg talks about grieving with talking, time, and tears. Okay, so you, you got to talk about it. Don't bottle it up. Find someone that you can tell 
I'm sad that someone has left. I'm sad, right? It takes time. Like, it's not like, hey, I just want to tell you something. I'm sad that someone's left. Boom, right, I think I'm, I'm cool now. You know, it's like, no, it can, it, can take, it can take time grieving this. Tears, shed real tears. When those tear ducts swell up, don't try and bottle it up. You know, let, let it out. It's part of the grieving process. But find someone in your life who can mourn with you. And can I just say to everyone here, please, be the person that will mourn with other people when they need someone to mourn. When, next time someone comes to you and says, I'm sad that church isn't working out right. I'm sad that someone's just walked away from Jesus. I'm sad that one of my friends just moved away. Don't be the guy who says, well, Romans 8, 28, my brother, all things work together for good. There's a time for telling them that, but your first job is to mourn with them, to say, I hear you, that sounds sad. I would be really sad if I was in your situation. I'm here for you, do you wanna talk about it? Okay, um, and, and then give people validation. Now, let me be clear about what validation is and what it isn't, okay? I don't mean tell people, oh, you're so special, you're so wonderful, you're one in a million. I don't mean that, but what I mean is, when someone tells you they're sad, that someone's left their church, you can validate that feeling and you can say, do you know what? I understand why you've been sad. You don't even have to approve of people and what they're doing in their life to validate how they feel about something. But it's amazingly healing for people when you validate how they're feeling about something. And as an image bearer, it's what we're supposed to do, right? God is the God who says, I have seen your suffering. I have heard you cry out. So as his image bearers, we also want to say, yeah, I get that you're sad about that. That makes sense. And when we do that, we reflect the God of all comfort well. So what I'm saying is when your ministry is shrinking, when your church is shrinking, do grieve it and find people, get people in your life that you can mourn about this. Okay. Having said that, Let's check out 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Paul says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. There's certain thoughts in our minds which aren't obedient to Jesus. There's certain ideas in our heads that are actually setting themselves up as an argument against Jesus building his church. Jesus says, I'm building my church. In our minds, we're like, we don't realize we're doing this, but deep down we're like, no, you're not. The church is shrinking. And I think I should quit now. Okay, because we're not really believing Jesus is building his church. So when your church is shrinking, when people walk away, when people move for good reasons or for bad reasons, reframe the situation. How you're thinking about things, you want to interrogate it. It's like at RTU a few years ago, I said with thoughts, some of them you need to bundle them in the back of a van, beat them up, yeah? And you need to interrogate them. And you need to say, why my soul do you feel this way? Put your hope in God, okay? And so we need to reframe these situations. So let's just look at ways that we can reframe when your church or your ministry is shrinking, right? One way is that, have you noticed when people leave your church, other people rise up? Now, I just want to check it isn't just me. Anyone just put your hand in the air if you've seen that. Okay, that, that's, that's quite a lot of hands, right? Good. That's not just me. Great. So, so people leave and you're like, oh my days, what are we going to do now? You know, it's like a football match and you've already had three blokes sent off with a red card and, <laughs> and then... And, th and then you've got a whole bunch of injuries and then someone gets a transfer deal to Southampton and you're like, what are we, how can we carry on playing the game? And then you see people stepping up in various ways and serving in ways that they didn't serve before. And sometimes it's because that, that person that's just left your church, people used to really think that person's got it sorted. Oh, there's someone hurting in the church right now. Oh, I bet that person's going to talk to them. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, cool. 
And when that person's left the church, then people are like, that person looks like they're really hurting. Guess I better go and talk to them. And then they go and talk to them. And then they're like, rah, I can do this by the spirit's strength. I'm able to minister to people and, and help people. I can't believe it. God gave me the words. I didn't think I'd have the words, but he gave me the words. And, and, and then you see people rising up. God is, is rising people up by his spirit. So you can reframe the situation. Yes, we lost our striker. But one of our midfielders now is trying to play more up front and it's working. Another way of reframing it is, and you've got to be careful with this one, how you do this, but when people leave, some difficulties leave with them. Now, it's not always really bad difficulty. Sometimes it's just the case that you could not do that many teas and coffees for people at church. And it was the straw that broke the camel's back last Sunday, but a couple have just left. That's two less cups of tea. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now listen this is real talk though like that i speak from experience and i'm not saying this with any like bad attitude about anything i got a dearly loved brother sitting right over there who left our church recently and we <laughs> and we love him we love him but he likes to eat you know and <laughs> So you shed some tears that your brethren's left. And then when you're preparing the church meal next week, you're like, ah, there's going to be enough food for everyone. (laughs) Now, sometimes there's the more serious issues, isn't it? Like um, those of you who are pastors, you've had to hold a lot of secrets for years of some things people have been going through in the church that have made life really, really difficult and no one else in the church has ever known about it. And then someone leaves and then there is actually that relief. Even though you're sad to see them leave, you're like, I don't have to keep that deep secret anymore from all the members. And every time someone says, we're so-and-so, I don't have to suddenly go really quiet and dumb. And, uh, you know, I can actually, I can actually, I've got some relief in that area. Or even some, I mean, I tell you, when I was first a pastor, I was very young. First pastoral problem I had, I did not know how to sort it out at all. I never read about this situation in any books, what to do. And I won't tell you what the problem was, but it was complicated. And I was like, I don't know what to do here. And then the people left the church and it was like, oh, I don't have to worry about (laughs) what to do here. So reframe stuff. Sometimes there's stuff that was too difficult for you to, to, to deal with. You didn't have the tools for dealing with it and God is rearranging things and God's freeing you up to focus on some other, other difficulties. Another thing I want us to consider is that churches growing and shrinking is normal. It's the normal ebb and flow. So we live in a success-oriented culture where you think you're just supposed to keep growing and growing and growing and growing, okay? But the reality is, That is not normal church life. It's not the way Jesus has been building his church for 2,000 years. So check it out. My favorite church historian is Kenneth Latourette, okay? And he wrote this book there on the screen, The History of Christianity. This is volume one, it's condensed version. I mean, if you see what he wrote, it's just ridiculous. Like, I think it's like 16 volumes. It goes, like, it's just ridiculous. This is like the abridged version, volume one. It's like that fat. Volume two is that fat. The bibliography is ridiculous. And he couldn't even fit everything in the bibliography that he wanted to. Like, this guy's done his homework, right? And for us guys, what's important about La Tourette is that he he really cared about what was going on at the margins. So when he did church history, he kept looking at what was happening at the margins, which is really helpful. Now, what he says is he says, and everything you hear for the next five minutes is all La Tourette, by the way, pretty much all, yeah? Just slightly paraphrased by me. He basically says, in church history, what you see is advance and retreat. Advance and retreat, or expansion and recession. That's what you see for 2,000 years whilst Jesus has been building his church. So, the first 500 years, hey Shane, you'll like this, some history here. First 500 years. If you look at the big picture of the first 500 years of the Christian faith, 
Okay, I'm, I'm admitting there's continuity with the Old Testament, but we're starting at after Jesus' death and resurrection. Okay, the big picture, you see the shape of the church pretty much established. How we do church today is heavily influenced by how church took shape in the first 500 years. And during this time, most of the Roman Empire professed faith. That's pretty huge, right? Most of the empire professed, professed faith, okay? So in the big picture, 500 years, wow, that's amazing. Jesus is building his church. But look at the smaller picture, right? And by the way, this will be on YouTube with these handouts. So if you're desperately trying to take all this down, you, you can, if that's your process, do it. But, but if I also want to let you know, it will be on YouTube. So if you want to sit back and enjoy the ride, that's cool as well. The smaller picture is that at some times, churches seemed like failures. In those 500 years of success, there were people just like all of us lot who were discouraged and they were like, boy, we are a failure. There was persecution at various times, okay? There were leaders renouncing their faith because of persecution. And there were all kinds of heresies going on. So the small picture can often look discouraging whilst the bigger picture is proper encouraging. But check it out, even though stuff was growing, Christianity appeared to be a regional religion. It looked like it was the religion of the Roman Empire. From a worldwide perspective, because remember the Roman Empire wasn't the whole world. From a worldwide perspective, it looked like a cultural tradition. And it looked like, look, there's loads of different cultural traditions. One of them is Christianity. And that was a problem. For the gospel to go worldwide, there needed to be a transition. How does that tie in with us today? Well, for some of us, our idea of success is what we've seen in some of the bigger churches, in some of the more wealthy churches reaching a wealthier demographic of people. But the thing is, that idea of growth and success is not always ideal because what have we got in the UK? We've got an idea that Christianity is a middle-class religion. And it's very often tied in with culture, because I'm sure plenty of you have heard people say, oh, no, I could never go to church, you know, because culturally it just doesn't apply to them. But they feel like a terrible sinner. And we're like, what's happened? It should be the people who feel like terrible sinners. They should be the ones saying, oh, yeah, I should go to church. But we're in a similar position to the first 500 years. So we need a transition like they needed it. And some of you guys are slogging away in your areas and you're thinking, is, is it worth it? Like Julian was saying earlier. And of course, the right answer is, is what the question should be is, is he worth it? Yeah. Uh, so it, it should be that. And thank you for that message, Julian. That was so helpful. So at the same time, I want you to understand that what you're doing is really important because you're part of a transition Part of a transition in this nation of communicating to people that Jesus died for all kinds of people and Christianity is not a middle class cultural pursuit. It's for everyone. So let's talk about the transition. The next 500 years, 500 to 1000 AD, La Tourette said this period suffered the greatest losses which it has ever encountered. Its very existence was threatened. So just check that out, 500 years of growth, and then 500 years of recession. It's normal. Is it the case that for 500 years, Jesus wasn't building his church? No, he promised he's building his church, but part of that process of growth sometimes involves shrinking. If your church is shrinking, it doesn't mean Jesus isn't doing his thing. It just means this is part of the process. Now check it out, the empire, Roman empire and Roman culture declined during this time period. And remember, Christianity was associated with Roman culture. So this actually ended up being a good thing because it brought about the transition that people would understand Christianity wasn't a cultural thing. Maybe some of the shrinkage in churches in the UK is a good thing in that people are learning that Christianity isn't what people thought it was. You had Muslim Arabs invade the Mediterranean, right? And they took half of the territory that had been gained in the previous 500 years. Imagine how discouraging that was being a Christian back then. 
It's like you see all this growth and then you see half of it go. And I know you guys have seen that in your churches and it can be really discouraging, but it's normal. Um, morale hit rock bottom. So during this period, Christians, their morale was proper low. Some of you might have come here today with low morale, and I want you to understand that that is normal. That's what your brothers experienced during a 500 year period. It's normal to feel that way, but at the same time, reframe it and recognize this is part of Jesus building his church, part of him bringing a transition. Because check out what else happened. More people groups were added to the church. So territory was lost, but more different people groups added to the faith. You had outposts established. Now I had to look up the word outpost. I love the word outpost. It's a great word, but I didn't know what it meant. So I looked it up. It means remote branches. There were remote branches of Christianity established, right? Maybe your church is a remote branch of Christianity. Okay, and that is significant. That's part of God's history. The angels are looking at that and watching that. And they're like, yeah, we saw this years ago in Scotland. Because what happened, right? Outposts were established. You had the gospel go from Ireland to China and from Scotland and Scandinavia to Nubia. These places in the 500 years before, they weren't getting the gospel. But now the gospel was going to new people. A transition was happening where Christianity was being understood as a cross-cultural thing, as a transcultural thing. Now check it out. Your church might be shrinking in numbers, but have a think, and this will come up in the workshop after this, have a think about, have you been reaching some new people groups? Have you been reaching some new subcultures? Have you been reaching an age range you weren't reaching before? Is there an ethnicity that you now reaching that you weren't reaching before? Reframe stuff, because just because numbers go smaller doesn't mean that the gospel might not be making more jumps to different cultures. And we talked about that years ago on RTU about the gospel going viral, how it jumps across little cultural gaps. Um, and that could be happening in your church. So be encouraged about that. Okay, next 500 years or so, 950 to 1350. You had 400 years of advance. So now it's really encouraging. It's like, wait, we're growing again. But what Latourette points out is that more significant. And, and by the way, just, if you want to read this, all this stuff is in the first few pages of this book. Okay? It's really easy to get this information. I just want to make that clear, because in case any of you thought like, rah, Duncan has gone through all these books and carefully picked out all these things. Like, no, this guy, like, he does it all for you in the first few pages. He outlines this. Um, and then it makes you want to read the book, because you're like, I want to hear all these stories. Um, he said that more significantly... The Christian faith produces outstanding personalities and important movements in thought and organization, and it helped to bring into being new cultures. So what he's saying is, yeah, the church was growing, it was advancing, but more importantly, there were personalities developing. Now, your church might have shrunk, but I bet when you look around your church family, you can see people that have really grown and you can see personalities that have developed. And you've seen God chiseling away at people by his word, through his spirit, doing amazing work in people's lives and helping them to represent Jesus well amongst their friends and family and whatnot. So look out for that kind of growth as well. How is God developing personalities amongst us? Be encouraged by that. Reframe the situation. But also, he says, in thought and organisation which helped to bring it into new cultures. And that's what happens in it. When your church shrinks, you have to rethink things, don't you? You're like, hang on a minute. We can't do that mums and toddlers group we used to do. We don't have the staff for it. What can we do instead? And you start thinking about stuff and then you're like, we need to do this kind of thing. And it helps you start something new. Or you have something dreadful happen at church. It's kept you awake for nights. You've hardly had any sleep. And it impacts you so much that it changes your spirituality because now when you read the Bible, you keep seeing that thing you went through mentioned in the Bible. And you're like, the Bible says a lot about this. And it changes you because you now realize that that thing you didn't think was very important in God's eyes is very important. 
And you now know how, where you need to repent and where you need to change. And as a church, you start changing. You move away from things before that didn't seem like a big deal. You know, like in the early days of your church life, you were probably like, okay, guys, we mustn't get drunk. That's the thing. And it's, it's a thing, right? But years later, you're like, guys, we mustn't gossip. It's terrible. And it's all over the Bible. We mustn't do it. Well, guys, we mustn't trample over people and be mean to people. It's just so not like Christ. And you start emphasizing other things that you missed before. And a whole new spirituality and a whole new movement, a Christian thought, comes out of that and changes lives. And who's not to say that those things aren't the very things that lead to people becoming Christians, people not committing suicide, people being so damaged by the church that they walk away and never want to look back again. So these things are significant when you're thinking about Christianity is chiseled during the times that your ministry shrinks. Okay, now let's look at 1350 to 1500. So that's just 150 years. There was a decline. It wasn't as bad as the one we talked about earlier, 500 to 950. But during this time, a lot of territory was lost and there was a lot of corruption in the church. There was also disorganization. So, so you might have experienced that in your church, a whole bunch of corruption. You know, you suddenly find out that the, the treasurer has been taking all the church money and stuffing it in his mattress, you know? And you're like, oh my days, what do we do about this? And it's, it's terrible and it's so discouraging. Okay, but during this period that this was going on in the church, there was still some expansion into new areas. And for some of you guys who had that experience with the treasurer, after that, you're like, we need to start a cap course. Yeah, we're like, because our treasurer got in debt and he didn't know what to do with it, you know? And like, we got to do something about this problem. And then you do a cap course and then now you're meeting non-Christians in the neighborhood and now they're getting discipled and becoming Christians. And it's like the gospel has moved into new areas. And during this time, new movements got started. So just reframe all these things. A lot of the bad things that happen in your church lead to new movements being started. Okay, 1500 to 1750. This is where you got the awakenings happening, right? So it's a good time. Christianity changes the shape of a lot of Western Europe. So as Christians, we were shaping the culture of Western Europe, yeah? There were positive changes going on in, in, the, in the East, in Eastern Christianity. And during this time, missionaries took the gospel further than it had been before but also further than any other religions had carried their messages. So an, an incredible time going on here. But then look at the next thing, 1750 to 1815. Some people thought Christianity was over. Okay, this is how some Christians felt. Now, aren't we like this? We're in the 1500 to 1750 stage. We're really encouraged about our church. Oh, it's great. I was so uplifted at church today. The worship was really good. Oh, that message. Oh, yeah. And you see those newcomers who came. They really heard the gospel. Oh, it's wonderful. We got a baptism next week. And then a month later, you're like, oh, it's over. <laughs> I'm sure the church has only got a couple more Sundays and that's it. You know, and we, we got to reframe stuff in the bigger picture. Jesus is building his church by growing it and shrinking it, growing it and shrinking it, expanding it in different areas as he does it. So during this period, you had Spain and Portugal decayed. And of course, they were big players with Christianity in the previous period. You had new intellectual movements that you philosophy students know about, which were a threat to Christianity. And you had wars and you had revolutions. So it was a time where it seemed like Christianity's had it now. But Latourette says this was a pause, not a retreat, because there wasn't much territory lost. And there were small movements arose that were going to become significant later, but not in this period. And that's like guys like Adoniram Judgen, Judgen? Adoniram Judson, yeah, went to Burma. He didn't think he was a success, right? All right, if, if, you don't, if you don't want to be depressed, don't read his book, okay? <laughs> that is a sad book. But if you really want to know the big picture, like ministry and all that, read, read his book, you know? Boy, I feel like pause for tears now, like just thinking about his life. But he didn't think he was significant. 
And yet now I'm told that there's thousands of Burmese Christians who would consider him their spiritual father. (laughs) So he started a small movement that wasn't significant then, but then was later. How do we know that the small things we're doing now aren't going to be significant later? I mean, some of us have been around long enough to know that council estate ministry, although it has been happening for years and years, in some Christian tribes almost wasn't a thing 20 years ago. And it was the kind of thing that if you said to someone, I'm planting a church on a council estate, people would be like, like, I went to my elders and said about doing a work on my council estate. And we had millionaires in our church. And I was told, he was a good guy, but he said to me, this is, you know, over 20 years ago, he said, he said, Duncan, our church is too affluent to be interested in you doing a work on a council estate. Now, today, that probably wouldn't happen, right? Today, people would be like, hey, our church is affluent. Do you want us to fund you to do that? Because urban ministry now is like the new thing. Like, it sounds cool. It will look great in our magazine, right? (laughs) But some of you were slogging away years ago and helping to make space that it actually became a known thing in your tribe so that now there's other people who are enabled to plant churches because you were the first ones to break through the wall years ago. In the same way, there's guys who, there's guys who way back in the 50s were doing council estate ministry and they were like breaking through the wall, paving the way for other people. So bear in mind what you're doing could be significant later. Now, 1815 to 1914, we've almost got to today. Uh, The Western world was being shaped by anti-Christian forces. So before that, Christianity was influencing the world, shaping the culture. Now you had thinkers who were hostile to Christianity shaping the culture. So you think, oh, it's all doom and gloom, right? Like a lot of Christians think today, oh no, everyone's taking over. The liberals are taking over. The Muslims are taking over. Whoever you want to name it, they're taking over, you know? And it's like, we're all doomed How can anything ever work? But during this period, when that was happening, Christianity spread around the world more than between 1500 to 1750. So Christianity spread more than the period when there'd been this pause, which had just followed the period where Christianity was on a roll and shaping Western thought. So what am I getting at here? I'm getting at the fact that just because you feel like there's lots of opposing views in the culture you're trying to reach, doesn't mean it's over. Christianity could even spread more. So don't get worried about what you're hearing people say on social media or the radio or whatever. Also, Christianity was a key feature of all the new nations formed. Now, I am am very grieved about colonization. And what happened. So I just want to be clear about that. I do not think what the British Empire did with colonization was a good thing at all. I think it was a terrible thing. So I just want to say that. And I also want to acknowledge that when new nations were formed, which has caused untold problems since, but when new nations were formed, Christianity often became an integral part of those new nations. So even when really bad stuff is happening in the world, with politics and all that. (laughs) For those of you on YouTube, yesterday was Brexit Friday. And it's still, I thought it was over, but then I see still, it's still the debating is going on. But the, the thing is, still, even with that, God in his sovereignty can be bringing bad things out of good things, which doesn't condone the bad things, but it shows us that Jesus is still on his throne building his church. Okay, so now let's talk about present day. 1914 to the present day, Christianity is now worldwide. Okay, it's gone through the transitions it needed to, so it could be a worldwide religion. Latourette says it's not dominant, but it's more potent. In other words, it's more influential than it was before. And that's the thing. We can't expect Christianity to become dominant. I mean, if your eschatology is post-millennial, and then you might you could legitimately say I'm waiting for Christianity to become dominant. I'm not a post-millennial myself, but I got love for you guys still. Um, but, but, 
but we're not, we're not really imagining that Christianity is going to become dominant. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. If you're expecting your estate to be dominated by the church, I think you're probably going to be quite disappointed and you just can't guarantee or engineer that God's going to do that. But you can think in terms of influence. You can say Christianity right now is more influential than ever before. It's not dominant, but it's influential. What about what has the influence of our church been? And I challenge you to do this in the coming week. Start making a list of the names of everyone your church has had interaction with. Okay? It will be a long list. And you will be surprised. You'll be surprised at how much influence you guys have had. And you might be like, but Duncan, some of the people on that list, they're not Christians. It's still significant. You know, army cadets, right? Um, the MOD spends a lot of money on army cadets. And a general or someone, an army officer once told me why. He said, we like to spend lots of money on army cadets because even though most of the cadets don't join up, later in life, they're politicians, they're bankers, they're voters, they're general public who support our troops. And that's significant. And the thing is, there's people that you guys have influenced in your life. And there are people that even if they're not Christians, they have a favorable view of Christians now. They know what a Christian is and they share that with their mates. And when their mates are saying, oh, you know, Christians, they're all hypocrites. They say sometimes, yeah, some of them are, but I knew some good people once. They were the only people who visited me in prison. Or they might be like Trevor Noah. I heard Trevor Noah on The Breakfast Club, which is a radio show that's shown on YouTube, talking to Charlemagne, who's a hip hop radio personality. And Charlemagne was saying some stuff about God. And Trevor Noah corrected him and started explaining the gospel to him. Trevor Noah is not a Christian, but he started explaining the gospel. And he gave one of the best illustrations I've ever heard to explain the gospel. And then Charlemagne, started like chatting about God saying how the Trinity is all messed up. You know, it doesn't really work. And then Trevor Noah started explaining the Trinity to him. <laughs> this is on the Breakfast Club. Like there are so many people who have seen that and they've heard someone who don't believe preach the gospel, okay? Because he was influenced. Okay, so some of the people on that list, you'll be like, they're not Christians anymore, but they're gonna preach the gospel. God will raise up stones. God will talk through a donkey. God will talk through the people you've shared the gospel with who said they don't want to believe in Jesus, but God will be like, I'm going to use that and, and spread the gospel. You know how there's like an Apple ecosystem, right? Like with, with Apple, if you, if you get an Apple product, you then get five gigabytes of on, free online storage. You start using it, you're like, this is great. I wonder why they give it away for free. And then what happens is then someone sends you an iMessage message and then they send you a video and then you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then someone says, hey, can you send me that file? And I'm like, uh, what, do you want me to email it? No, just airdrop it. And you send it to your, their MacBook and you're like, oh, that looks cool. And then you get one of those. And then you find out you can send it to your TV with an Apple TV. And in the end, you get caught up in this whole Apple ecosystem. And you never want to leave Apple because you're in the ecosystem. Now, the same way your council estate or your neighborhood has an ecosystem. And you guys have been working hard. And in some way, you've probably put your church somewhere in that ecosystem. There's been people from your community that have come to you for support. There's people from your community that see you as part of their daily life in the neighborhood. And you've become part of your neighborhood's ecosystem. And that is so significant because it means that there's some people that one day are gonna become a Christian just because you're part of that ecosystem. There's people that you're gonna keep bumping into because you're part of that ecosystem. Think about your influence in terms of how have we become part of our neighbor, neighborhood's ecosystem. Even if you feel like, well, we're not really killing it at the moment. I mean, people only see us on Sunday. Are there people from the neighborhood that see you and then come and visit you and you chat to them outside the church building? Just look for positive ways to see your influence and also consider how can we spread our influence. Also think about the long term. How are you contributing to the long term plan of what Jesus is doing, building his church? Top picture there is my estate in the 60s. 
you can see a small number of trees. Growing up when I was a kid, it, it was okay to call it a concrete jungle, you know? But when I was a kid, someone had the foresight to plant trees. And when we were kids, we didn't get it. These trees were about this high. And to us as kids, they just looked like pieces of wood that had been stuck in the ground. So all we did was we got sticks and we battered them. You know, like you would go out, you would play football for a bit. And then when you were a bit too tired, you would get sticks and you would just batter these trees. You know, it's like, we don't know what these trees are good for. We're just going to batter them. Same way, like some of you get a hard time from some of the people in your neighborhood. Oh, you Bible bashers. And really, they're the ones bashing people. You know, they're giving you a hard time. And you're thinking, is it really worth it? Remember what Julia said? Is he worth it? Is Jesus worth it? Yes, he is. But you're thinking, is it worth it just getting all this hassle from people? You know, they don't seem to understand what the church is here for, you know? And, and, and we would just whack these trees all the time. Well, years later, I got it. I don't hit the trees anymore. Now I see them. Look at the bottom picture, all these trees. Now I see them and I'm like, rah. You know, it's harder to get prayer support now because, you know, you gotta say, <laughs> Pray for us in the concrete jungle. People are like, are you sure? God, I wish I had that many trees where I live. You know? And, and the other day I was out with my kids and see one of my boys just running down that, that hill in the midst of all these like planted daffodils which haven't come to bloom yet. And I was just thinking when I was a kid, I remember going down that hill on my bike and getting shot at. And with, with, with an air gun, no less. But this... But this but here's my son running down with like these daffodils that are growing up ready to, and I was like, why, why, why the transformation? Because someone had the long-term goal and people like me didn't get it at first, but now we get it. Same way, what you're doing in your churches seems like a small thing right now, but God says, don't despise the day of small beginnings, right? And he's doing something, he's got a long-term thing. What we're doing, right, what we're doing is we're doing something that's gonna reverberate for all eternity for Jesus's glory, okay? So next thing, we wanna reorg. When you've had people leave your church, reorg. In the army, right? I don't know if they still do this, but they used to do this. When you've gone through a skirmish, you come under fire or something, at one point, whoever's commanding you will shout, reorg! And then you all get round in a circle on the ground, okay, facing outwards so you can see the enemy. And then you communicate how much ammo you've all got and how wounded you are. You're reorganizing yourselves from the skirmish. When people leave your church, when the church is shrinking and you're wondering, are we going to keep going or is it time to give up? It's time to reorg. It's time, for those of you who are leaders, watch your people, have a look, see how people are doing, chat to people and just see how people are getting on. And then do things like fill the gaps. If someone's left a big gap in your church, how can you fill that gap? Find ways to fill those gaps or, and change systems to alleviate the burden. What happens is people leave the church and we carry on doing things exactly the same way because that's how we've always done it for years. And after a while you realize there's some things we do and we don't need to do anymore. There's some things that don't make any sense anymore. We have the interpreter at the back, but actually we haven't had our Farsi family turn up for two years. So maybe we don't need to keep miking up the interpreter each week, you know? Um, and you know, various, various things like that. Change systems. It's amazing if you just think outside the box how much you can change systems so that stuff works better. Do guerrilla warfare. You know, um, does anyone know who this bloke is here? No one from Scotland here. Robert, Robert de Bruce, yeah. So Robert de Bruce, some rate him as the greatest guerrilla warfare fighter ever. Because he was fighting the English and the English had all the resources and Robert de Bruce didn't have the resources, right? So what did he do? He thought outside the box, he came up with guerrilla warfare tactics and he beat the English with all their resources. Same way, time after time, Small churches keep trying to copy the big churches. And, and you end up spending so much time trying to copy the big churches and it, it doesn't work. Because instead we need to be like, so how do we do guerrilla warfare on our neighborhood? What, what can we do that works? 
So let me just share something real simple. On a Sunday after our service, we have a hot meal at church, okay? We have a hot meal at church. And here's the thing. That hot meal has brought about so much fruit. It's unbelievable. One of the ways it's brought about fruit is I have a disability, which means I'm often not available at certain times, especially in the evenings when my pain levels are just too high to think or hold a conversation with people. Sometimes it's because of that Sunday meal, I can be sitting with someone and conversating with them about stuff. At that Sunday meal, we start building up with trust with people who are never going to come around your house. But we've actually created a third place on the estate now where people come. Sometimes people just come for the meal. And then months later, they come for the two worship songs before the meal. And a little bit later, they come for the tail end of the sermon before the two worship songs before the meal. And a bit later, they come halfway through the sermon. Or they come for the beginning of the sermon. And you see this gradual process going on. And the thing is, it don't take any resources. Now, I know there's people here who work hard on that meal who are like, hang on a minute, it does take resources. But check it out. Corporately, it doesn't take resources. Here's the thing. We all got to eat, right? We all eat on a Sunday. But most of us eat on our own on a Sunday. We're each spending time preparing our food. We're spending money buying our food. We're cooking our food. And then we're doing the washing up afterwards. Well, you actually spend less money, spend less time if you do it corporately, okay? Uh, You have, say, like three people doing the meal instead of having 25 people doing their own individual meals. And then you maximize your time together in terms of fellowship. That's just a quick example of guerrilla warfare. But don't copy that. Do what works for you. I think that every conference where a church says, this is what we do, you should do it, also needs to say, and this is our church budget, okay? Or every magazine article that says we do this program, that program. What's your budget? Because I think some of you sometimes might be trying to copy people who have a budget that is 10 times bigger than yours. You've got to do guerrilla warfare. You've got to work out what works with our budget. And then the next thing, pray. Pray. You know, that's what we've got to do, in it? And that was one of the things that come up in Julian's workshop that value of prayer. We've got to be praying because unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. So we've got to be praying. Okay, let me finish with this. What we want to be doing is Christ-centered building work. And at this stage, I'm just going to ask my brothers at the back to put a a video on. Um, So some of you guys, you're slogging away if, if the, uh, are you going to play the video or just, cool, wonderful. So some of you guys, I don't know if you can see that on the screen there, um, but some of you guys are slogging away doing building work, right? And what's, what's going on is that from your angle, it looks like not much is happening. Just like at this screen. From your angle, it looks like not much is happening, right? And you're digging away and you're focusing on what's going on at the bottom and you're like, oh, is it worth it? And then you see someone else digging over a bit higher and you're like, I wish I was digging in there a bit. That looks way better. And some of you are approaching that way with ministry and your focus, I speak for myself as well, my focus becomes too much on what I'm doing, you know, and we're missing the big picture. And if only we could see what it's going to look like at the end when Christ comes back. When we see him in all his glory on the pinnacle of everything that he has built, his church, and see all the different ways he's used us to build his church, if we could just have a glimpse of that, we would understand better all this stuff that we're doing now. So let's fix our eyes firmly on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's follow him, keep our eyes focused on him and trust that he is building his church And that all these small things that we are doing are part of the bigger picture and is all going to be for his glory. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and you are building your church. And we thank you for the privilege of being a part of that. Thank you that you use us. And Lord, I confess that too many times I focus on the work and I don't focus on you. And I'm sure 
a lot of the time I am doing this thing just like without doing it for you, but just doing it because it seems like a thing I'm supposed to do. And I'm sorry, Lord. I pray that you'd help all of us to be building for your glory, to be able to trust that you are building your church even when stuff seems to shrink. And Lord Jesus, please use us to build your church for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.